Lindo Jong, Double Face. My daughter wanted to go to China for her second honeymoon, but now she is afraid. What if I blend in so well they think I'm one of them? Waverly asked me. What if they don't let me come back to the United States? When you go to China, I told her, you don't even need to open your mouth. They already know you are an outsider. What are you talking about? She asked. My daughter likes to speak back. She likes to question what I say. Ah, <sighs> yeah, I say. Even if you put on their clothes, even if you take off your makeup and hide your fancy jewelry, they know. They know just watching the way you walk, the way you carry your face. They know you do not belong. My daughter did not look pleased when I told her this, that she didn't look Chinese. She had a sour American look on her face. Oh, maybe ten years ago, she would have clapped her hands hooray as if this were good news. But now she wants to be Chinese. It is so fashionable. And I know it is too late. All those years I tried to teach her. She followed my Chinese ways only until she learned how to walk out the door by herself and go to school. So now, the only Chinese words she can say are shi shi, huo zhe, chi fan, and guan dong, shui jiao. How can she talk to people in China with these words? Pee pee, choo choo train, eat, close, light, sleep. How can she think she can blend in? Only her skin and her hair are Chinese. Inside, she is all American made. It's my fault she is this way. I wanted my children to have the best combination, American circumstances and Chinese character. How could I know these two things do not mix? I taught her how American circumstances work. If you are born poor here, it's no lasting shame. You are first in line for a scholarship. If the roof crashes on your head, no need to cry over this bad luck. You can sue anybody, make the landlord fix it. You do not have to sit like a Buddha under a tree, letting pigeons drop their dirty business on your head. You can buy an umbrella or go inside a Catholic church. In America, nobody says you have to keep the circumstances somebody else gives you. She learned these things, but I couldn't teach her about Chinese character. How to obey parents and listen to your mother's mind. How not to show your own thoughts, to put your feelings behind your face so you can take advantage of hidden opportunities. Why easy things are not worth pursuing. How to know your own worth and polish it, never flashing it around like a cheap ring. Why Chinese thinking is best. No, this kind of thinking didn't stick to her. She was too busy chewing gum, blowing bubbles bigger than her cheeks. Only that kind of thinking stuck. Finish your coffee, I told her yesterday. Don't throw your blessings away. Don't be so old-fashioned, Ma. She told me, finishing her coffee down the sink. I'm my own person. And I think, how can she be her own person? When did I give her up? My daughter is getting married a second time. So she asked me to go to a beauty parlor. Her famous Mr. Rory. I know her meaning. She is ashamed of my looks. What will her husband's parents and his important lawyer friends think of this backward old Chinese woman? Auntie Anmei can cut me, I say. Rory is famous, says my daughter, as if she had no ears. He does fabulous work. So I sit in Mr. Rory's chair. He pumps me up and down until I am the right height. Then my daughter criticizes me as if I were not there. See how it's flat on one side? She accuses my head. She needs a cut and a perm. And this purple tit in her hair, she's been doing it at home. She's never had anything professionally done. She's looking at Mr. Rory in the mirror. He's looking at me in the mirror. I have seen this professional look before. Americans don't really look at one another when talking. They talk to their reflections. They look at others or themselves only when they think nobody is watching so they never see how they really look. They see themselves smiling without their mouths open or turned to the side where they cannot see their faults. How does she want it? Asked Mr. Rory. He thinks I do not understand English. He's floating his fingers through my hair. He's showing how his magic can make my hair thicker and longer. Ma, how do you want it? Why does my daughter think she's translating English for me? Before I can even speak, she explains my thoughts. She wants a soft wave. We probably shouldn't cut it too short. Otherwise, it'll be too tight for the wedding. She doesn't want it to look kinky or weird. 
And now she says to me in a loud voice as if I had lost my hearing. Isn't that right, Ma? Not too tight. I smile. I use my American face. That's the face Americans think is Chinese, the one they cannot understand. But inside I am becoming ashamed. I am ashamed she is ashamed because she is my daughter and I am proud of her. And I am her mother, but she is not proud of me. Mr. Rory pats my head more. He looks at me. He looks at my daughter. Then he says something to my daughter that really displeases her. <gasps> oh, it's uncanny how much you two look alike. I smile, this time with my Chinese face. But my daughter's eyes and her smile become very narrow, the way a cat pulls itself small just before it bites. Now Mr. Rory goes away so we can think about this. I hear him snap his fingers. Wash, Mrs. Zhang is next. So my daughter and I are alone in this crowded beauty parlor. She is frowning at herself in the mirror. She sees me looking at her. The same cheeks. She says. She points to mine and then pokes her cheeks. She sucks them outside in to look like a starved person. She puts her face next to mine side by side and we look at each other in the mirror. You can see your character in your face, I say to my daughter without thinking. You can see your future. What do you mean? She says. And now I have to fight back my feelings. These two faces, I think, so much the same. The same happiness, the same sadness, the same good fortune, the same faults. I am seeing myself and my mother back in China when I was a young girl. My mother, your grandmother, once told me my fortune, how my character could lead to good and bad circumstances. She was sitting at her table with the big mirror. I was standing behind her, my chin resting on her shoulder. The next day was the start of the new year. I would be ten years by my Chinese age, so it was an important birthday for me. For this reason, maybe she did not criticize me too much. She was looking at my face. She touched my ear. You are lucky, she said. You have my ears, a big thick lobe, lots of meat at the bottom, full of blessings. Some people are born so poor, their ears are so thin, so close to their head, they can never hear luck calling to them. You have the right ears, but you must listen to your opportunities. She ran her thin finger down my nose. You have my nose. The hole is not too big, so your money will not be running out. The nose is straight and smooth, a good sign. A girl with a crooked nose is bound for misfortune. She is always following the wrong things, the wrong people, the worst luck. She tapped my chin and then hers. Not too short, not too long. Our longevity will be adequate, not cut off too soon, not so long we become a burden. She pushed my hair away from my forehead. We are the same, concluded my mother. Perhaps your forehead is wider, so you will be even more clever. And your hair is thick, the hairline is low on your forehead. This means you will have some hardships in your early life. This happened to me, but look at my hairline now, high. Such a blessing for my old age. Later, you will learn to worry and lose your hair too. She took my chin in her hand. She turned my face toward her, eyes facing eyes. She moved my face to one side, then the other. The eyes are honest, eager, she said. They follow me and show respect. They do not look down in shame. They do not resist and turn the opposite way. You will be a good wife, mother and daughter-in-law. When my mother told me these things, I was still so young. And even though she said we looked the same, I wanted to look more the same. If her eye went up and looked surprised, I wanted my eye to do the same. If her mouth fell down and was unhappy, I too wanted to feel unhappy. I was so much like my mother. This was before our circumstances separated us. A flood that caused my family to leave me behind. My first marriage to a family that did not want me. A war from all sides. And later an ocean that took me to a new country. She did not see how my face changed over the years, how my mouth began to droop, how I began to worry but still did not lose my hair, how my eyes began to follow the American way. She did not see that I twisted my nose, bouncing forward on a crowded bus in San Francisco. Your father and I, we were on our way to church to give many thanks to God for all our blessings, but I had to subtract some for my nose. It's hard to keep your Chinese face in America. At the beginning, before I even arrived, I had to hide my true self. 
I paid an American-raised Chinese girl in Peking to show me how. In America? She said, you cannot say you want to live there forever. If you are Chinese, you must say you admire their schools, their way of thinking. You must say you want to be a scholar and come back to teach Chinese people what you have learned. What should I say I want to learn? I asked. If they ask me questions, if I cannot answer. Religion. You must say you want to study religion, said this smart girl. Americans all have different ideas about religion, so there are no right and wrong answers. Say to them, I'm going for God's sake, and they will respect you. For another sum of money, this girl gave me a form filled out with English words. I had to copy these words over and over again as if they were English words formed from my own head. Next to the name, I wrote Lindo Sun. Next to the word birth date, I wrote May 11, 1918 which this girl insisted was the same as three months after the Chinese Lunar New Year. Next to the word birthplace, I put down Taiyuan, China, and next to the word occupation, I wrote student of theology. I gave the girl even more money for a list of addresses in San Francisco, people with big connections. And finally, this girl gave me, free of charge, instructions for changing my circumstances. First, she said, you must find a husband. An American citizen is best. She saw my surprise and quickly added, Chinese, of course. He must be Chinese. Citizen does not mean Caucasian. But if he is not a citizen, you should immediately do number two. See here, you should have a baby. Boy or girl, it doesn't matter in the United States. Neither will take care of you in your old age. Isn't that true? <laughs> and we both laughed. Be careful, though, she said. The authorities there will ask you if you have children now or if you are thinking of having some. You must say no. You should look sincere and say you are not married. You are religious. You know it is wrong to have a baby. I must have looked puzzled because she explained further. Look here now. How can an unborn baby know what it is not supposed to do? And once it has arrived, it is an American citizen and can do anything it wants. It can ask its mother to stay. Isn't that true? But that is not the reason I was puzzled. I wondered why she said I should look sincere. How could I look any other way when telling the truth? See how truthful my face still looks. Why didn't I give this look to you? Why do you always tell your friends that I arrived in the United States on a slow boat from China? This is not true. I was not that poor. I took a plane. I had saved the money my first husband's family gave me when they sent me away and I had saved money from my 12 years' work as a telephone operator. But it is true, I did not take the fastest plane. The plane took three weeks. It stopped everywhere. Hong Kong, Vietnam, the Philippines, Hawaii. So by the time I arrived, I did not look sincerely glad to be here. Why do you always tell people that I met your father in the cafe house, that I broke open a fortune cookie and it said I would marry a dark, handsome stranger, and that when I looked up, there he was, the waiter, your father. Why do you make this joke? This is not sincere. This was not true. Your father was not a waiter. I never ate in that restaurant. The cafe house had a sign that said Chinese food, so only Americans went there before it was torn down. Now it is a McDonald's restaurant with a big Chinese sign that says Mai Dang Lao, Wheat East Building. All nonsense. Why are you attracted only to Chinese nonsense? You must understand my real circumstances, how I arrived, how I married, how I lost my Chinese face, why you are the way you are. When I arrived, nobody asked me questions. The authorities looked at my papers and stepped me in. I decided to go first to a San Francisco address given to me by this girl in Peking. The bus put me down on a wide street with cable cars. This was California Street. I walked up this hill and then I saw a tall building. This was Old St. Mary's. Under the church sign in handwritten Chinese characters, someone had added, A Chinese ceremony to save ghosts from spiritual unrest, 7 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. I memorized this information in case the authorities asked me where I worshipped my religion. And then I saw another sign across the street. It was painted on the outside of a short building, Save today for tomorrow at Bank of America. And I thought to myself, This is where American people worship. See? Even then I was not so dumb. Today that church is the same size, but where that short bank used to be, now there is a tall building, 50 stories high, 
where you and your husband-to-be work and look down on everybody. My daughter laughed when I said this. Her mother can make a good joke. So I kept walking up this hill. I saw two pagodas, one on each side of the street, as though they were the entrance to a great Buddha temple. But when I looked carefully, I saw the pagoda was really just a building topped with stacks of tall roofs, no walls, nothing else under its head. I was surprised how they tried to make everything look like an old imperial city or an emperor's tomb. But if you looked on either side of these pretend pagodas, you could see the streets became narrow and crowded, dark and dirty. I thought to myself, why did they choose only the worst Chinese parts for the inside? Why didn't they build gardens and ponds instead? Oh, here and there was the look of a famous ancient cave or a Chinese opera. But inside it was always the same cheap stuff. So by the time I found the address the girl in Peking gave me, I knew not to expect too much. The address was a large green building, so noisy. Children running up and down the outside stairs and hallways. Inside number 402, I found an old woman who told me right away she had wasted her time waiting for me all week. She quickly wrote down some addresses and gave them to me, keeping her hand out after I took the paper. So I gave her an American dollar and she looked at it and said, Xiaojie, miss, we are in America now. Even a beggar can starve on this dollar. So I gave her another dollar, and she said, Hey, you think it is so easy getting this information? So I gave her another, and she closed her hand and her mouth. With the addresses this old woman gave me, I found a cheap apartment on Washington Street. It was like all the other places, sitting on top of a little store. And through this three-dollar list, I found a terrible job paying me 75 cents an hour. Oh, I tried to get a job as a sales girl, but you had to know English for that. I tried for another job as a Chinese hostess, but they also wanted me to rub my hands up and down foreign men, and I knew right away this was as bad as fourth-class prostitutes in China. So I rubbed that address out with black ink, and some of the other jobs required you to have a special relationship. There were jobs held by families from Canton and Toisan and the four districts, Southern people who had come many years ago to make their fortune and were still holding onto them with the hands of their great-grandchildren. So my mother was right about my hardships. This job in the cookie factory was one of the worst. Big black machines worked all day and night, pouring little pancakes onto moving round griddles. The other women and I sat on high stools, and as the little pancakes went by, we had to grab them off the hot griddle just as they turned golden. We would put a strip of paper in the center then fold the cookie in half and bend its arm back just as it turned hard. If you grab the pancake too soon, you would burn your fingers on the hot, wet dough. But if you grab too late, the cookie would harden before you could even complete the first bend. And then you had to throw these mistakes in a barrel, which counted against you because the owner could sell those only as scraps. After the first day, I suffered ten red fingers. This was not a job for a stupid person. You had to learn fast or your fingers would turn into fried sausages. So the next day, only my eyes burned from never taking them off the pancakes. And the day after that, my arms ached from holding them out ready to catch the pancakes at just the right moment. But by the end of my first week, it became mindless work and I could relax enough to notice who else was working on each side of me. One was an older woman who never smiled and spoke to herself in Cantonese when she was angry. She talked like a crazy person. On my other side was a woman around my age. Her barrel contained very few mistakes, but I suspected she ate them. She was quite plump. Uh, Xiaojie. She called to me over the loud noise of the machines. I was grateful to hear her voice, to discover we both spoke Mandarin, although her dialect was coarse-sounding. Did you ever think you would be so powerful you could determine someone else's fortune? She asked. I didn't understand what she meant. So she picked up one of the strips of paper and read it aloud, first in English. Do not fight and air your dirty laundry in public. To the victor go the soils. Then she translated in Chinese. You shouldn't fight and do your laundry at the same time. If you win, your clothes will get dirty. I still did not know what she meant. So she picked up another one and read in English. Money is the root of all evil. Look around you and dig deep. And then in Chinese. Money is a bad influence. You become restless and rob graves. What is this nonsense? I asked her, putting the strips of paper in my pocket, thinking I should study these classical American sayings. They are fortunes, 
she explained. American people think Chinese people write these sayings. They are fortunes, she explained. American people think Chinese people write these sayings. We never say such things, I said. These things don't make sense. These are not fortunes, they are bad instructions. No, miss, she said laughing. It is our bad fortune to be here, making these and somebody else's bad fortune to pay to get them. So that is how I met Aunt May Sue. Yes, yes, Auntie Aunt May, now so old-fashioned. Aunt May and I still laugh over those bad fortunes and how they later became quite useful in helping me catch a husband. Uh, Lindo, Aunt May said to me one day at our workplace, come to my church this Sunday. My husband has a friend who is looking for a good Chinese wife. He is not a citizen, but I'm sure he knows how to make one. So that is how I first heard about Tin Zhang, your father. It was not like my first marriage, where everything was arranged. I had a choice. I could choose to marry your father, or I could choose not to marry him and go back to China. I knew something was not right when I saw him. He was Cantonese. How could Anmei think I could marry such a person? But she just said, We are not in China anymore. You don't have to marry the village boy. Here. Everybody is now from the same village, even if they come from different parts of China. See how changed Auntie Yan Mei is from those old days? So we were shy at first, your father and I, neither of us able to speak to each other in our Chinese dialects. We went to English class together, speaking to each other in those new words, and sometimes taking out a piece of paper to write a Chinese character to show what we meant. At least we had that, a piece of paper to hold us together. But it's hard to tell someone's marriage intentions when you can't say things aloud. All those little signs, the teasing, the bossy, scolding words, that's how you know if it is serious. But we could talk only in the manner of our English teacher. I see cat, I see rat, I see hat. But I saw soon enough how much your father liked me. He would pretend he was in a Chinese play to show me what he meant. He ran back and forth, jumped up and down, pulling his fingers through his hair, so I knew. Mangjila. What a busy, exciting place this Pacific telephone was, this place where he worked. You didn't know this about your father, that he could be such a good actor. You didn't know your father had so much hair. Oh, I found out later his job was not the way he described it. It was not so good. Even today, now that I can speak Cantonese to your father, I always ask him why he doesn't find a better situation. But he acts as if we were in those old days, when he couldn't understand anything I said. Sometimes I wonder why I wanted to catch a marriage with your father. I think An Mei put the thought in my mind. She said, In the movies, boys and girls are always passing notes in class. That's how they fall into trouble. You need to start trouble to get this man to realize his intentions. Otherwise, you will be an old lady before it comes to his mind. That evening, An Mei and I went to work and searched through strips of fortune cookie papers, trying to find the right instructions to give to your father. An Mei read them aloud, putting aside ones that might work. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Don't ever settle for a pal. If such thoughts are in your head, it's time to be wed. Confucius say, a woman is worth a thousand words. Tell your wife she's used up her total. We laughed over those, but I knew the right one when I read it. It said, a house is not home when a spouse is not at home. I did not laugh. I wrapped up the saying in a pancake, bending the cookie with all my heart. After school the next afternoon, I put my hand in my purse and then made a look, as if a mouse had bitten my hand. What's this? I cried. Then I pulled out the cookie and handed it to your father. Ugh, so many cookies. Just to see them makes me sick. You take this cookie. I knew even then he had a nature that did not waste anything. He opened the cookie and he crunched it in his mouth and then read the piece of paper. What does it say, I asked. I tried to act as if it did not matter. And when he still did not speak, I said, translate, please. We were walking in Portsmouth Square and already the fog had blown in and I was very cold in my thin coat. So I hoped your father would hurry and ask me to marry him. But instead... He kept his serious look and said, I don't know this word spouse. Tonight, I will look in my dictionary. Then I can tell you the meaning tomorrow. The next day, he asked me in English, Lindo, can you spouse me? And I laughed at him. 
and said he used that word incorrectly. So he came back and made a Confucius joke, that if the words were wrong, then his intentions must also be wrong. We scolded and joked with each other all day long like this, and that is how we decided to get married. One month later, we had a ceremony in the first Chinese Baptist church where we met. And nine months later, your father and I had our proof of citizenship, a baby boy, your big brother Winston. I named him Winston because I liked the meaning of those two words, wins, tan. I wanted to raise a son who would win many things, praise, money, a good life. Back then I thought to myself, at last I have everything I wanted. I was so happy. I didn't see we were poor. I saw only what we had. How did I know Winston would die later in a car accident? So young, only sixteen. Two years after Winston was born, I had your other brother, Vincent. I named him Vincent, which sounds like win cent, the sound of making money, because I was beginning to think we did not have enough. And then I bumped my nose riding on the bus. Soon after that, you were born. I don't know what caused me to change. Maybe it was my crooked nose that damaged my thinking. Maybe it was seeing you as a baby, how you looked so much like me, and this made me dissatisfied with my life. I wanted everything for you to be better. I wanted you to have the best circumstances, the best character. I didn't want you to regret anything, and that's why I named you Waverly. It was the name of the street we lived on, and I wanted you to think, this is where I belong. But I also knew if I named you after this street, soon you would grow up. Leave this place and take a piece of me with you. Mr. Rory is brushing my hair. Everything is soft. Everything is black. You look great, Ma, says my daughter. Everyone at the wedding will think you're my sister. I look at my face in the beauty parlor mirror. I see my reflection. I cannot see my faults, but I know they are there. I gave my daughter these faults. The same eyes, the same cheeks, the same chin. Her character... It came from my circumstances. I look at my daughter, and now it is the first time I have seen it. Hey, what happened to your nose? She looks in the mirror. She sees nothing wrong. What do you mean? Nothing happened, she says. It's just the same nose. But how did you get it crooked? I ask. One side of her nose is bending lower, dragging her cheek with it. What do you mean? She asks. It's your nose. You gave me this nose. How can that be? It's drooping. You must get plastic surgery and correct it. But my daughter has no ears for my words. She puts her smiling face next to my worried one. Don't be silly. Our nose isn't so bad, she says. It makes us look devious. She looks pleased. What is this word devious, I ask. It means we're looking one way while following another. We're for one side and also the other. We mean what we say, but our intentions are different. People can see this in our face. My daughter laughs. Well, not everything that we're thinking. They just know we're two-faced. This is good? This is good if you get what you want. I think about our two faces. I think about my intentions. Which one is American? Which one is Chinese? Which one is better? If you show one, you must always sacrifice the other. It is like what happened when I went back to China last year, after I had not been there for almost 40 years. I had taken off my fancy jewelry. I did not wear loud colors. I spoke their language. I used their local money, but still they knew. They knew my face was not 100% Chinese. They still charged me high foreign prices. So now I think, what did I lose? What did I get back in return? I will ask my daughter what she thinks.